Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and give Jesus a mighty, mighty hand of praise. Amen. 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 Take a moment. Give someone a hug. And tell them it's for Jesus. Tell them it's for Jesus. Give thanks and glory to God for this far He has brought us. We've been mightily blessed by Pastor Tom and Kate Hess that gave us an opportunity to lay foundation hearing from Jerusalem. But from now onwards, however, we want to move forward in line with the theme of this gathering, which is Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And the apostles asked Jesus a question. Are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus answered and said, It's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, maker of all things, we give you praise and thanks. Lord, we thank you for gathering us together here. Lord, we know that there is nothing you do without a purpose. So we pray, Father, that your purpose for bringing us together at such a time as this shall come to pass. Lord, open our understanding. Give us revelation. Give us wisdom that we may be able to take what you are giving us and go forth to bear fruit. And may our fruit remain. Father, let your kingdom come and let your will be done. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that hand clap. Now let's give one to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Now, let us first of all try to understand the situation in which this passage was given to the apostles. They had been working and walking with Jesus for three years, seeing the great power and signs that he performed. And then something happened and Jesus was arrested, which led to his death, which completely confused them. And uh, 
almost made them despair of hope. You remember when he met the two men on the road to Emmaus? sound, interpreters sound. Thank you. He asked them, what is it you are talking about so passionately? And they said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened? And they told him about the events of the past few days. About this Jesus of Nazareth who was a great and mighty prophet and teacher. And they said, and we even hoped that he would be the Messiah. He, we thought he was the one. In other such was their confusion that they no longer know what was right and what was wrong. So in such a situation, God, Jesus had to bring back their minds. The Bible says he opened their understanding. Everybody say with me, open their understanding to understand the scriptures. Amen? That's very, very important to remember. And he began to explain to them the scriptures about himself until they eventually recognized him. Later on, he appears to the twelve. And as we see in the book of Luke 24, again the scripture says, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So there are times we may even be reading and quoting scriptures without understanding them. It takes his moving upon our hearts to open our spiritual eyes. Now I want us to imagine the joy, the sense of triumph that the apostles felt when they realized this same Jesus had really risen back to life. He is not defeated. He is actually beyond touch of, of the forces of the world. They felt like they were on top of the world. They knew he is above all governmental power military power, prisons, and whatever. And he was above the power of death. So they, they knew everything is possible. Anything is possible. And what do you think they were imagining? For a long, long time, we have been waiting for the promises of God. The Lord said he will send us a Messiah. We have been under these Romans ruling us. The time has come. Israel should now be independent again. I mean, the kind of things they were thinking about were good things, but we are in the natural realm. Master, are you now going to establish the kingdom of Israel? Are we now going to become self-independent? Self that is the same kind of spirit. All of us who love Jesus feel. When we get to the place where we know the world can no longer shake us. My Jesus is greater than the world. My Jesus is more powerful than anything in the world. And you realize you are on the, on the winning side. It is a natural thing to start saying, well, why not get it? Get everything now. 
Jesus, why don't you prosper me now? Why don't you why should I stay in a small house when the other man who doesn't know you is staying in a big house? Are you now going to take us to the heights? It's not you. When we feel powerful, we want to act powerful. When we feel victorious, we want to appear victorious. And that is the spirit sweeping all across the world today. Not only here in Uganda, all over the world. The Christians are being taken up more and more by a desire to show the world that they are on the winning side, that they are on the prosperous side, that their heads are not tails. And there is nothing wrong with this as long as it aligns with the purposes of God for that season. Someone say amen. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know what God has already put in his own seasons. But this is what I want you to know. You shall receive power. You shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And from that moment, you will be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Judea, in, Judea, in Samaria, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Beloved, I believe many of our speakers are going to come at this verse from many angles. They will bless us in many ways from that this very passage. But I want to appeal to you. Please try and connect with what I'm sharing with you now. Because it forms the foundation upon which all others are going to be building. If you can connect with this, you'll connect with all flows of blessings that emanate out of this passage. Amen. Amen. Now, let me just call your attention to the word witness. Yesterday I said, we want to look deeper into the word power. And into the Holy Spirit. And then into the purpose. Why is the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon us? And I said yesterday, most of us think this power is all about casting out demons and maybe working signs and wonders. And yes, that power can do all of that. But I also mentioned yesterday that working miracles, signs and wonders was not new to the apostles. They had been doing it. Every time Jesus said, now you go. Preach that the kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Raise the dead. Freely you are given, freely give. They had done it before. Not once. Not twice. They had seen power. But although they had tested power, they had be been weak in the greatest moment they should have been standing with Jesus. In that hour, when Jesus said to them, my heart is so full of sorrow to the point of death. Please stay with me. 
Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus ever express a need for support. Yes, we are like in a country no better for what we are except in that moment. Said, my, my heart is so full of sorrow to the point of death. Please Bambi. stay with me. It's like, stand with me. And in that moment, he left them to pray. And he went them to pray apart. When he came back after an hour, he said to he found them sleeping. I want you to consider if you say to somebody, please stand with me. Stand with me in this hour. And the moment you turn around, you look up, you look back and he's dead asleep. You feel like he's real standing with you. You don't feel like he's there for you. You don't feel like he's determined to see this to the end. And listen to the words of Jesus Christ. Couldn't you stand with me for even an hour? Brother, sister, that moment is not for casting out demons. It's not for healing the sick. It's not for raising the dead. It's for standing in the hour of need. It is for standing when the Lord wants you there. And for that, we need power. Power to be witnesses for Jesus. After they failed him on the first count, he said, okay, pray for yourselves that you may not be tempted. I was meditating on this one then I thought, oh my God, that sounds like pray that you may not fail. In the hour of testing, in the hour of trial, pray for yourself. If you cannot do it for me, pray for yourself that you may not fail. And he left them. And he went back to pray alone. Hoping they are standing with him. When he came back after an hour, they were sleeping. Put yourself in his footsteps. How did he feel? What did he feel? What was the emotion in his heart that he ended up saying no word? He looked at them and turned away. Or went back to talk to his father. Does that show you a man who is very happy with his support? And when he went back, he cried and said to the father, Father, all things are possible to you. Please take this cup away from me. The second time the Bible says, he had prayed saying, if possible, take this cup from me. But not my will. Let your will be done. Third time he said, Father, all things are possible to you. Please take this from me. Just to give us an understanding. Why was he going to go through the passion? That cup. For who? For us. For us. And he's saying to some of our representatives. This thing is filling my heart with sorrow. I feel like dying. Stay with me. 
He's doing it for who? For us. And that is our record of standing for him. And the last prayer said, Father, all things are possible. Take this cup from me. And the Bible says, he prayed so hard that his sweat was like, was drops of blood. Think about that. He is in such turmoil and struggle with himself to the point that he's sweating blood. And the people he's dying for are there sleeping. The father did not answer that prayer as he asked it. The father sent angels to strengthen him. So I can imagine them saying, Master, please, Stay, stay put. Don't give up. Don't turn away. They came to strengthen him. And when he came back, he said, The hour of the evil one has come. But he has got nothing in me. Wake up. Let us go. It's almost like I don't need any further support. It's done. Whatever has done, been done has been done. I have been betrayed. I'm going to go through with it. But it's okay. The evil one has got nothing in me. Wake up. Let's go. Every day, you and I go through trials. And Jesus says, Come on. Stand. Stay with me. Stay with me. How do you feel when he comes and says, Okay, it's, it's done. Maybe you don't know that feeling. I know that feeling. In 1994, the Lord sent us into a fasting of 40 days. But he told us, don't pray for your needs. Pray for what I tell you to pray. For. And then he told us to pray against bloodshed. And we prayed for AIDS. Then he came back and said, pray for bloodshed by war. And we prayed for Joseph Kony. And then he came back and when he made it, made it clear, pray for blood, for death that comes out of war. I was the leader. I told the, oh, I know what the Lord is talking about. In those days, Yugoslavia was falling apart. Croatia, Serbia, Herzegovina, they were all fighting. So I told them, let's pray for Yugoslavia. Do you see what's happening? He is the one who told us to enter the fast. He said, don't pray for your needs. Pray as I lead you. He's leading us. But I, as the leader, I take, I take responsibility. I was trying to interpret, oh, I think the Lord means this. Pray about death. Oh, you in, there's so much death by AIDS. Let us pray for AIDS. He says, Pray for blood shed by war. Oh, there's war by Joseph Kony. Let us pray for Joseph Kony. Do you see that kind of obedience? It was missing the mark each time. And then God used a young girl, a young woman. 
She was called Siba. She used to work as my secretary. And she said, the Lord is saying, pray for Rwanda and Burundi. There had been some bloodshed in Rwanda. But it had been suspended. And there were pistols even at that very time. The East African presidents were in Tanzania, in Arusha. Talking peace. So naturally, there was no urgency about Rwanda. But she said, the Lord has said, we pray for Rwanda. He said, okay. So we prayed. After praying, we went to sleep. 20 minutes later, she says, Brothers, let us wake up. The Lord says, let's pray for Rwanda. And we woke up. And we prayed. After half an hour, she said, Pastor John, the Lord says, we need to pray. I said, Shiba, now listen to me. We have prayed. And we shall pray. But now, let's take the time to rest. It was around, uh, way beyond midnight. We shall pray more when we wake up. This is Pastor John. The Lord says we pray now. It's it's now or never. I said, Shiba. Okay, okay, okay. Go to sleep. She went back to the room where they were sleeping. But she kept crying. She was mourning. She was crying and was saying, this girl, she can't let us have some peace. And around five, Around four, she went very wild. She was like crying and like she was dying. Then around five, she went quiet. And at that time, we were waking up. So we woke up, we started praising the Lord, but she stayed sleeping. Actually, before she slept, she came to me and said, the Lord says, you can sleep. It's already done. And I said, what does that mean? He said, Brother John, I saw a vision. I saw a plane in the air. And it burst into fire. I don't know what it means. But the Lord said, you can now sleep. I said, you can change nothing now. I didn't understand. I, I let it be. Later on, the news comes. The previous night, the plane that was carrying the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi had been shot down. And that began the genocide. Almost one million people killed in, was it three months? Almost a million people died in three months. I, you don't know how every day I felt like I wanted to tear myself apart. I said, what is it that got into me? Why didn't I at least go and ask God, what are you saying? Mm. I mean, when the Lord says now, you can change nothing. I remember there was a pastor a Rwandese pastor with a, church, a congregation who used to use the same building we were using on William Street. After the war, the entire congregation packed. They were going back to Rwanda. And I came to bid them farewell. I was crying. Because we... we what we saw in those days, 
you can't imagine. People were being killed in Rwanda and their bodies floated and came in Uganda. We stopped eating fish from Lake Victoria. Every morning, the police would go with boats to pull out the bodies. The newspapers called it harvesting the bodies. How many people remember that time? Any Ugandans? Come look around, look around. What we are talking about. Is, is factual. It's not a myth. So I, as I watch this, this congregation packing to go, I said, Lord, I'm willing to go to Rwanda. I'm willing to go do anything you want me to do. Just give me some guidance. I'm willing to take clothes, medicine, food, and any help that is necessary. And this is what the Lord said to me. You can change nothing now. Now, in short, he said, if you had prayed through the night, you would have stopped this. But because it was not stopped, I want you to know what happened. A new principality has been instituted in the heavens. And he is covering the nation of Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Congo, and even beyond. And it's a bloodthirsty principality. You are going to see bloodshed. Not only in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Congo, in Sudan. You see it in other nations all around. And it will not stop until the cycle runs its course. I cried. And I said, Lord, forgive us. And said, you are forgiven. But you cannot change anything. You all know the stories of Rwanda. After Rwanda, Burundi started. After Burundi, Congo started. The, the war that overthrew Mobutu. And then after Mobutu left. Mobutu and uh, what's his name? The president of Congo. Uh, president of Congo, Kabila. Kabila. Kabila, Nadja. Kabila the number one. Again, the war started again to take to 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 take to overthrow Kabira, and he got reinforcement from Zambia, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Chad, Central African Republic. So soon we had a small African world war. And it went on for several years. And even after that, the wave continued in Sudan. Soon we saw it in Kenya. It's it's been moving in the region. Maybe you've never had this experience. I know what it feels for the master to say, okay, it's over. You can sleep if you want. You can change nothing now. That's what I was trying to paint for you between Jesus and the apostles. I am saying all of this to show you that there is a power 
the apostles did not have at that time. They had been casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, preaching the gospel. But in this hour, they did not have the power to stand for Jesus. When he needed them to stand for him, stay with me. In Uganda, they And they couldn't stand. And when the things began to happen, they all were not prepared. Peter pulled out a sword. He wanted to fight with a sword. The master says, ah, ah, that's not the kind we are fighting. Put it back. And when they were arresting him, they ran away. Tell your neighbor, they ran away. You will receive power to be witnesses for me. They were not witnesses for him. When they took him before the high priest and before Pontius Pilate and they accused Jesus of all falsehoods, there was no witness for him. There was no one to say, no, that's not true. There was no one to say, I know him. When, when, they, when he was running away and they got hold of his coat, he he unbuttoned and left it the Bible says we were naked. He was not ready to stand with Jesus. Peter came back Peter after having run away. And a, a young girl, a mere girl, says, Hey, didn't I see you with him? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. And the girl went away. Then came back and said, but surely you are a Galilean. Even your accent is Galilean. You are one of them. And said, I tell you, I don't know him. I don't know him. And the girl went and said, I'm a Come and see. This is the man. He is one of them. The Bible says, Peter cast. He cast. How dare you put me together with him? How dare you say I'm together with Jesus? How dare you? He cast. And at that moment, the rooster crowed. And Jesus turned and looked at him. And Peter realized, Oh my God. Now, do you think all the demons he cast out were important? All the he, the, 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 the illnesses he healed, I don't know how many dead people he raised. It made no difference. Jesus turned and looked at him. He had warned him, Peter, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Brother, tell your neighbor, you will receive power. Man. 
to be a witness. To be a witness. I was reading many, many years ago. I had this hunger for revival. I love to read revival stories. I loved to study men who had worked in revival. One of my favorites was Charles Finney. I loved that man. I read of stories where the presence of God around his life would be so heavy that he would come into a city to do an evangelistic campaign. And the, they say, the presence would cover the entire city. And all crime would, so, would stop. Saloons or bars would stop operating. Prostitution would stop during the time he's in the city. This one is more than just saying to a demon, come out. This is what it means to say, thy kingdom come. And let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the government from heaven coming down upon a territory. And the government of the earth lays down its weapons. Because the Bible says, when the light appeared, the darkness did not comprehend it. I loved the stories of Charles Finney. And so I remember when he walked into a factory. And the power of God began touching all the workers in the factory. They could no longer go on with spinning the, 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 the cotton wool. In the end, they had to stop all the work. And they created an evangelistic meeting for him. I read of times when he would just look someone straight in the eye. And the conviction of the Lord would consume them. And they would end up broken and crying for forgiveness before God. There were all kinds of mysterious things that the Holy Spirit did through this man. I read somewhere that possibly the retention levels of his evangelism are higher than any other evangelist. No. By, by retention levels, I mean, when a hundred people confess Christ, in many places you retain 20. The others confess, but then they fall back. But his retention levels were always above 80. They would remain true. And one day I read a statement that he wrote. And he said, The power from above is not power to work miracles. Because they worked miracles before they received that power. They cast out demons before they received that power. He said, but that power of the Holy Spirit is the power to stand acceptably before God and prevail with God. In spite of everything that may be negative, but you come and prevail 
into acceptance. Where even though the Lord would say, like in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, God says, Do not talk to me about those people. Do not pray to me. Do not intercede for them. Because even if you do, I will not listen. Don't you see what they are doing? When God says that, Father, it's, it's like the door is closed. And God says, even if Moses or Samuel were to stand before me, I'll not listen. When I was reading that passage, many times I would be con- I would be overtaken by God will not listen. He must be very angry. And I would dwell on that. But one day, my attention said, wait a moment. God is saying, even if it is Samuel, even if it is Moses, even if it is Noah, hey, what is special about this? In others, God is saying, you are not all at the same level when you come to approach me. When some people come, they can go deeper into my presence than others can. There are some who come, and even if I said I will not listen, when the angels say, it is Samuel, and God says, okay, let him come in. Speak and you'll be heard. Not all of us pray the same. Not all of us speak at the same level of authority. There are some that have got a higher level of authority. And he says, even if it is Samuel, even if it is Moses, those were special ones. And I remember with Moses, God said to Moses, Go from my presence to your people. The people God used to call my people. I have had the cry of my people. Now he says, They are your people. They have turned away from me. I'm going to destroy them. And I'm going to raise another nation out of you. And Moses Musa interceded. I don't know how he cried out. Eventually he came down and he said, Aaron, what did the people do to you that you allowed them to mess themselves like this? How do you like such a question to be asked of you? What did the people do to you? Pastor, what did the God's people in your church do to you that you allow them to mess themselves up? As long as you get the material things you want. What did they do to you? And he said to the people, those who are for God, Jehovah, this way. Others, that way. Do you know what he did to them? He killed them. He killed them. And he took the golden calf. He destroyed it. Then he said to the people, Stay here. Maybe. I will go and make intercession for you. 
before God. And he went for another 40 days. Another 40 days. He had just finished 40 days without food, without water. He went back for another 40 days. Towards the end of the 40 days, the Holy Spirit allows us to hear the conversation between him and the Father. After 40 days, God says, I am going to destroy them. And Moses says, Lord, have mercy. But if you will not forgive them, take my name out of the book of life. Take my name out of the book. And God says, uh uh. Okay, I will forgive them. I will forgive them. But I'm going to strike them with the plague. Forgive, I forgive them. But punish, I'm going to punish them. They will not die. But I'll punish them. Moses says, okay. Okay. And the Bible says, and God struck them with plagues. After that, God says to Moses, Rise up, you and your people, whom you got from Egypt. I'm going to give you an angel to lead you to the land I promised your fathers. But me, I am not coming near you because I may break up like a fire and devour you. And Moses says, if you are not going with us, we are not going anywhere. How will the nations know that we are your people when you are not with us? I am not going. Look at how many times Moses is prevailing and winning one thing after another, but not yet a breakthrough. And God said to Moses, Exodus 33, Okay, go tell the people, put off your ornaments, your earrings, your nose rings, put them off that I may see what to do with you. Man of God, do you know what it means to pray a nation through? And Moses went and told the people, put off all your ornaments. In other words, humble yourselves before God. And they all do it. And Moses takes the tent of the meeting out into the wilderness. And he went there with Aaron. And with Joshua. Until the presence came down. Then he left Joshua there. And he said to the people, Every one of you, go meet your God. Go talk to him. So one by one they went. Intercession is no longer sufficient. Now everybody must go humble himself before God. At that time, the Lord said to Moses, I will go with you. And Moses says, if you will not go with us, I'm not going anywhere. And God says, I will go with you. And Moses says, if I have found mercy in your sight, and you have called me my, by your, my name, show me your glory. Show me your glory. It's like God saying, Moses. You cannot see me and leave. But it's okay. 
There's a place on the mountain where there's a cleft in the rock. I'll put you in there and cover you so that you don't see my face. Moses says, okay. The next day he goes there up the mountain and God comes and covers him. Then God passes by in his glory and he begins to proclaim his name. He says, the Lord, the Lord, great and compassionate, who does not leave people to go unpunished who are guilty, but he brings punishment upon their children and their children's children to the third and the fourth generation. But he also remembers mercy to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. Amen. And Moses says, Lord, if I have found mercy in your sight, forgive your people. They are stiff naked people, but they are your people. Please forgive them. And God says, I have forgiven them. And I will renew my covenant with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. I am going to work great works. The nations will know that I am their God. There is no God besides me. Praise the name of the Lord. What am I trying to illustrate? Here, it's not raising the dead. It's not casting out demons. It's not healing the lame. It is prevailing before the Lord. That is what God said. And I looked for a man among them who would stand before me and mend the breach and stand on behalf of the land. But I found none. There are times when it is impossible for anybody to come stand before God. But if you, you prevail, when you turn around, you prevail over all darkness, all powers of evil. You will prevail. And in such situations, God will allow circumstances to come which will attract the attention of everyone. And in those moments, you stand. You stand for Jesus. You stand for him. And when all things come, he says, I'll make you into a bronze tower. They will fight against you. They will not manage you. Hallelujah. Amen. There is a place of strength when the Lord builds a wall around you and says, fear not. I am with you. So what does he want you to do? Stand for me. That's what it means. You'll be my witnesses. Listen, brothers and sisters. Maybe tomorrow I will, I will read you this record. I went and made a search about the lives of the apostles. Because the Bible does not talk much about their last days. I went and made a research about the apostles. And I found every one of them died for Jesus. 
died for Jesus. Only one of them, Apostle John the Beloved, died a natural death. The others, some were crucified. Like Peter was crucified upside down. Some were crucified in an ex ex cross. Some were pierced by swords in the middle of riots. Some were burnt alive. And none of them run away. None of them ran away. Peter, Peter, when they were going to crucify him, he said, uh -uh, I can't die like my master. Turn me upside down. Then let's do it. He did not run away. He did not say, I don't know him. He said, you killed him. God raised him up. We are the witnesses. Hallelujah. John, the beloved, they took him and boiled him in a basin of hot oil. You can imagine it. Eh? You know when they are roasting this uh, sablenya. Deep frying. He was deep fried. And he refused to die. When he refused to die, they took him out and put him on an island alone. And even there, when he did not die, they said, let him go. And he came back and became the bishop of Alexandria. He continued serving God. Someone say amen. Those men were not the same men who ran away from Jesus. They were not the same men who denied Jesus. These were able to stand and say, I will gladly give my life for him. All of them I hope I remember. Tomorrow I'll, I'll bring you the record. And they died in distant nations. Some died in Spain. Some died in uh, nations of the former Soviet Union. India. In Egypt. All over. They were not even keeping together company. No, they could go alone and go do the work of God and be willing to die for him. Brother, sister, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses for Jesus in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Now, I'm coming to the end of my sharing tonight. Why is it so important? The kind of things I've been talking to you about. Because in the last days, it is going to call for that power. You will not be able to stand without it. Jesus spoke in the book of Matthew. Chapter 24. And this is how he describes the last days. And I want to read from verse 9. And he was talking to the apostles. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and they will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations 
for my name's sake. Now, the bunch that ran away on that night, could they stand for this? But he's telling them, this is what is going to come to you. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then, many will be offended. Not all of you are going to stand. Some among you will be offended. And they will betray one another. And they will hate one another. Now, which one are you? Which material are you? Humanly, all of us cannot stand. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are more than conquerors. And he goes on to say, and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness. Say with me, as a witness. Say it as a witness to all nations. And then the end shall come. Mm. If the end has not yet come, you and I should wait for these things. Ask your neighbor, have you heard that? The end will not come after all these things have been done. And the gospel has been preached in all the world to be a witness, a proof up to the very last day. Jesus will be saying quietly to one person and then to another. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't fear. This is the hour. Stay with me. The question is, if your hour came, will you sleep like they slept? Will you run away like they ran away? Will you deny him like Peter did? Will you curse those who try to team you up with him? What is it in you that assures you that you will not do that? And if you look at your own walk with the Lord, your own record as only known by you and God, do you think you are a worthy witness in these last days? Praise the name of the Lord. You're not answering me? Let me read you the same words of Jesus in another record. That is Luke. He's talking about those last days. And he says in verse 12, but before all these things 
they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering, a, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for a witness. Hallelujah. Amen. Or an occasion for a testimony. Imagine Jesus is talking to his disciples. And says, look, I'm going away. I'm leaving you in church. But I tell you, the time has come. They will arrest you. They will persecute you. They will kill you. Or they will take you to prison. They will take you to the kings. Because of my name. But don't worry. That situation will turn around for your witness. Amen. When that time comes, don't even worry what you're going to say. Because the Holy Spirit will give it to you. Jesus. Hallelujah. He goes on to say verse 14. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I'll give you mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. To Jesus, yes, these conditions are negligible. Arrest, prison, death, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm telling you, you are going to go through it. You are going to go through those things. Set to it in your mind. But don't worry. It's for your witness. You will be my witnesses. Hallelujah. Amen. And don't worry what you are going to say. Uh -uh. I'm going to give you mouth. And I'm going to give you wisdom. No one of your adversaries will be able to contradict you. Jesus is changing the priorities in their minds. He's changing what is important and what is not important. Where you and I would run, and my life is in danger. Says, Your life is not that. I, I am in charge of your life. Don't worry about that. Instead, worry about one thing that you will be my witnesses. Now you are thinking, do I really want to be a witness? Listen what he says. Verse 16. You will be betrayed even by your parents and brothers. By your relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all. For my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. Hallelujah. Amen. When I read this, I am baffled. I just think, this is not worldly wisdom. This is not human wisdom. This is not life by human standards. This is transformed life. I cannot attain it by my own efforts. I cannot strategize my way around it. It's not to be learned. Mm -mm. You will receive. 
receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And by that, you shall be my witnesses. Do you remember when he told them? Luke chapter 24. He said, these are the words I was telling you. Since I was with you, that from Moses, to the prophets, to the Psalms, everything written about me had to be fulfilled. That I had to come and die and rise up on the third day. And then, repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be preached to every nation in my name starting in Jerusalem. And you are the witnesses. You are the witnesses. But stay in Jerusalem. You will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you shall go out. He's saying everything I've told you will not do it. You need something else to, to, to be added. The power of the Holy Spirit. And then you'll go and do what? Be my witness. Hallelujah. He's t- looking at all these dangers and risks. And he's not scared. He's not intimidated. He's not saying, oh, I, I sympathize with you. No, he's saying, hey, hey. Oh, don't fear them. Who only kill the body. But cannot touch your soul. You and I know. The one who can even kill the soul. The soul. Be in your patience. Possess your souls. Don't fear. They are going to do all that. But you stand. And be my witnesses. Be my witnesses. Like you said to Peter that day. Stay with me. Stay with me. Brother, sister, a situation is coming in your place of work. A situation is coming in your home. And when it comes, everything in you is going to go wild. But you will hear a voice that will say, Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. The storms will rage. And when you lift your eyes, you, you want to run. And say, Shh. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stand and be my witness. Oh, glory to God. Glory to Jesus. It reminds me of another scripture in the book of Revelation. It says, Now salvation has come from our God. And woe to those who sit on earth. For the evil one has come to you. Knowing that his time is short. Then it says, But they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They are witness, not loving their lives unto death. There is another life God is calling us to. There is another level God is calling us to. It's not a level of fear. For the love of God casts out fear. In this position, we are more than conquerors in Him who enables us. Like Paul, we can say, we are persecuted daily, but we are not defeated. Every day they arrest us, but we are still free. They do all this to us, but we still prevail. God is looking for a people that the world will look at 
that. Do you remember when Jesus was hanging on that tree? And the Roman centurion said, Surely, this was the Son of God. Wow. <laughs> Jesus is wanting that to happen to you. That the world will look at you. What you go through. What you stand for. And what you refuse to compromise. And they will say. But I think God exists. I think there is God. Only God can do that. When the apostles, these men who ran away from Jesus, when they were filled with this power, they marched from city to city, turning things upside down. And the people saying, the men who turn cities upside down have come to our city. Woe unto us. There was something about them. Not just casting out one demon. Not just doing one sign. They were carriers of a kingdom. They were kingdom ambassadors. Their appearance on the scene means the kingdom has come. Hallelujah. Jesus said, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, then the kingdom has come to you. Brother, sister, the time is coming when you and I step into a city and those in the city call each other. What has happened? And they say, what do you mean? What do you mean? Something has happened. Something has happened. You know, I was reading a book that actually led me to make a decision for Jesus by Dennis Bennett. The day he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he came back home late in the night after 3 a.m. And he went straight to bed. That day he had been filled with power of the Holy Spirit, spoken in other tongues, seen visions, and all that. He went straight to bed. When he woke up in the morning, his wife said, Tell me about it. How did it happen? And said, How did you know? He said, when you came into the house, everything changed. Everything changed. She was sleeping. But when her husband arrived home, she knew he has got it. Because they have been talking about it. But the talking about it. And he, he, she knew he had gone to a meeting. When she, he came back, she felt it. And she knew, oh my God, he, he has got it. Do you remember Ugandans? Do you remember? The Lord said to us, it's not by your words that you will take this nation into its destiny. It's by the presence of God. By the power of his presence. And do you remember those prophetic words? You can still find them in that book, Nation at, Nation at Crossroads. The Lord said, if you are in your house, these houses which are jointed and you pray and pray and you break through and the presence comes all over you. It says, all your neighbors will wake up. They will all wake up. Not because you are shouting. Mm -mm. Uh -uh. There is a power current that will hit the houses. And they will know something else has come in. You know, 
in our villages here, many of you have experienced this. When we begin to pray and the presence begins to come in the village, the witches begin to panic. They, they, they go away for some days and they come back. After a few days, they go away. I remember the first time it happened when in Endeavor. And the man who was a witch doctor was very, like, 30 meters from the church. And he kept four, five dogs. Malnourished. But that is where his spirit rested. And people used to come to him and line up. But when we started praying and the Lord began to move with the presence of God, not only in our in the church building, in the community, he left and was away for a month. He came back, stayed for only four days. He left. When he came back, he stayed for a week. He left. And one woman asked us one day, what are you doing to the poor man? <laughs> what are you doing to the poor man? And we said, nothing. He said, uh, you are tormenting the man. He goes and spends a lot of money and brings back his spirits. The moment you start praying and praising there, he is being free. The man is dying of poverty. He's no longer making money. We were not even attacking his spirits. But the presence of God the presence of God. When the light came, the darkness did not comprehend it. Hallelujah. Brother, sister, in the next few days, we want to look deeper into this mysterious power. What is this power? How do we lay hold of it? How do we know we have it? What is the purpose of that power in our lives? And how do we stand as true witnesses for Jesus? And how is that supposed to manifest? Not only in our personal lives, but in our workplace, in our circles of influence, in our nations, in our cities, and wherever the Lord may send us. Amen. 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 Turn around, look straight in the eye of your neighbor and say, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you then you will be his witness. You will be his witness wherever he sends you. Hallelujah. Come and give him praise. Give him glory. Oh, hallelujah. Is this something you want to explore? Amen. Amen. Is this something you want to come upon your life? That which changed these men who were cowards. Who betrayed Jesus' trust. And yet suddenly they turned around. And they were willing to lay down their lives for him. Amen. Amen. Let's rise unto our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Tomorrow morning, I'll be taking the first session in the morning. So I just want to ask you to prepare your hearts. We are going to go 
further into this journey. Hallelujah. Amen.